Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Can we, can we gather our thoughts together? It's good to see everyone here. My name's Kirsty Thorpe. I'm, thank you so much. I'm Minister of Wilmslow United Reformed Church and it's very good on behalf of all of you to be able to welcome Dr. Rowan Williams to speak to us this evening. It's a particularly busy week for Rowan in the life of Magdalen College, Cambridge, and we're very glad, therefore, that he's able to spare this time for us. Priest, poet, philosopher, academic, member of the Gorsair, the Bards, chair of Christian Aid's Board of Trustees, Dr. Williams brings a rich breadth of experience to our discussion about discipleship this week. He bears the unique distinction of having been the first Archbishop of Canterbury since the English Reformation to be appointed from outside the Church of England, because he was serving as Bishop of Monmouth at the time. During his Episcopal ministry in Wales in the 1990s, he gave a significant boost to ecumenical relationships. I remember because I was living in Wales at the time. I also recall the willingness with which he accepted an invitation to meet with the United Reformed Church's Human Sexuality and Ordination Working Group. I was the secretary of the group. We had a fascinating discussion day in the flat of the late John Humphreys in the centre of Cardiff. Rowan had come on the bus and the train. He's a bishop who does public transport, no less. <laughs> And he is here with us today as someone who both knows his nonconformist church history and understands the traditions from which the United Reformed Church comes. That was obvious when he preached at a service in Westminster Abbey in 2012. It was marking 350 years since the great ejectment of 1662, the moment when dissenting ministers who wouldn't accept an established church, an imposed prayer book, and the rule of bishops were forced out of their livings. And Rowan's affection for us and respect for the URC shone out in his sermon that day. I should also say that everyone in the Abbey recommitted ourselves to work together for a different sort of future in ecumenical terms. And to top it all, Rowan came to us that evening for the service after a long day's deliberation in General Synod, when I'm sure he would far rather have been relaxing in some ways. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for being with us, Rowan. I have no doubt you're going to shine new light on the theme of discipleship for us in these three sessions. Thank you very much, Kirsty, and good evening all. <laughs> thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to be with you for a couple of days, and thank you for your extraordinary willingness to applaud. This is going to be the easiest <laughs> audience ever. <laughs> now, you may be wondering who on earth these people are that I'm going to be talking about, and I dare say that not very many of you will have heard of Maria Skoptsova, my first um, hero to discuss. But I'll begin by telling you a little bit about why I've chosen to talk about three particular individuals, what it is about them that might make them, against all probability, of some interest to ministers of the United Reformed Church. If we're talking about discipleship, about sanctity, about witness, about the integrity of the church, then it's always quite a lot better, I say, to tell stories than just to come out with theories. The three people I'm going to be talking about, all of them wrote quite a bit, and I'll be talking a bit about their writings, but each of them, in her very different way, represents what I'd call a theological narrative. That is, a life story which in itself tells us something about the nature of the gospel. A story which, if you tell it, 
does the theology for you? I would guess that most of us actually know such stories and that, I dare say, some of our most effective teaching and preaching comes when we let the stories do the theology for us. And Kirsty's reminded me of very happy days in Wales some time ago. And I have to say that the work of John Morgan's in Llanvair Penrhys was one of those theological stories that I told repeatedly when I was a bishop in Wales and have told repeatedly since as a story, quite simply, about what the church really looks like. Like that um, stupid man who went to Russia in the 1920s and said, I've seen the future and it works. Um, I think I could rather more plausibly say, I've seen the church and it works. And that's probably one of the most gospel-shaped things we can ever say, isn't it? I have seen the church and it works. And the stories we share with one another on an occasion like this are part of our deeper entrance into that mystery. And you could say again that the three people I'm talking about are people who exemplify something of that, the church working. One of them was Russian Orthodox, two of them Roman Catholic. All of them were people in varying degrees at odds with the prevailing culture of their church. They were certainly unconventional people. You'll get some sense of just how unconventional as we go through. They were also deeply loyal people. They believed in the church even when the church made their lives extremely difficult, which is not a wholly unknown experience in other Christian communions, I, <laughs> I dare say. <laughs> and it's that sense of integrity and loyalty together, which tells us something about the nature of discipleship, I think, as much as anything else. I wonder occasionally whether in the life of the first Christian community around Jesus himself, there was sometimes a tension between integrity and loyalty in the sense of people saying, well, I'm quite keen on Jesus, but I don't very much like Thaddeus. And the evolution of the apostolic community perhaps was an evolution towards a state where people realized that loyalty to Jesus just might involve loyalty to Thaddeus as well. And that something of that critical fidelity to one another is one of the effects of a real life-giving fidelity to Jesus. My three subjects were all of them people who lived a critical fidelity to the Christian community because of an extraordinary, deeply costly fidelity to Jesus. So you begin perhaps to get the picture. These are marginal people in some ways, and like all good marginal Christians, that meant they lived from the center. Dietrich Bonhoeffer helpfully confuses the edges and the center of the church in a lot of his writing, reminding us that the church is regularly renewed from the edges rather than what thinks of itself as the center. And that if we want to meet Christ, we have to go to the edge of what we're comfortable with to discover what the real center and heart of the world is. And again, my three subjects are people who are concerned to go to the center of the human world by going to the edge of the comfortable church. So without claiming them unreservedly as nonconformists, I think with a, a medium-sized N, we might just as well get away with it. So enough by way of general introduction, but I hope I've given you some sense of why these three women might be significant. And I've barely mentioned the fact that they're three women, which in the traditions they came from is itself worth noticing. All of them discovered the Christian faith or were discovered by Christ in their young adulthood. 
All of them had grown up in environments which were not particularly friendly to Christian faith or conventional religious practice. And Maria Skaptsova, whom I'm beginning with, was no exception. She was born in 1891 and born into a fairly well-to-do Russian family. Like many cultivated, thoughtful, and the uh, adjective is perhaps not quite appropriate in this context, Bolshe young people <laughs> in Russia at the time, she rebelled against both political and religious convention, and as a young woman threw in her lot with radicals in Russian politics. She was a friend of various people who were very active in the arts and poetry. She had a lot of radical political connections. And in the chaos of the Russian Civil War, which followed on the 1917 revolution, she found herself thrust into the midst of political activism and was for a short but quite significant period acting mayor of a little Russian town where she and her family had landed up. She had by this time married a left-wing activist. She was, however, not particularly welcome to the Bolsheviks. She was far too radical for conventional conservative Russians and far too idealistic for most of the Communist Party members. However, she made something of a success of being acting mayor of this little town. And when a group of marauding soldiers turned up demanding protection money from the citizens of this town, when all the other local officials said it would be easier to give way for a quiet life, Mother Maria, as she was to become later, Elisaveta at this point, simply called a community meeting, stood up in front of everybody and said, as long as I'm in charge of this town, they're not getting a penny. And said, if they want to shoot me, that's fine with me. <laughs> The marauding soldiers cheered and went away. <laughs> but Elisaveta was already, it seems, recognizing that her future could not lie in Russia. There's a whole generation of fascinating Russian Christian figures and other figures who are not just Christians, who, on the far side of the revolution, discovered that the revolution had not been revolutionary enough, that what had happened was simply another top-down system of power, as crushing and inhuman as what it had replaced, and they began to realize that they would be no more welcome in the new Russia than in the old. On top of that, Elisaveta's first marriage was in trouble. She was wrestling with a rediscovery of Christian faith, and beginning to sense at a very, very deep level that her obligations were not just to her fellow human beings, but to God. Like so many others, she ended up fleeing Russia and landed up in Paris in the early 1920s. Her first marriage had ended. She was left with three children to bring up. One of those children died at the age of five. She lived in conditions of extreme poverty and stress. But her sense of calling developed more and more deeply. And that sense of calling expressed itself above all in a ministry of hospitality. She began to organize welcome for other refugees, herself a refugee. She regarded her first priority as being to provide hospitality for those who, like her, had been cast on the world with no support and apparently no external hope. The house she eventually lived in, in the Rue Romel in Paris, became a center for refugees. And there are many accounts of the radical reckless character of her hospitality. We hear, for example, of one widowed Russian refugee with some mental health problems 
who simply kept her up all night, every night, talking through her problems. And Mother Maria, it is Vieta, gave this woman her bed and slept in the sitting room and was prepared to stay up till the small hours, simply listening to this woman's problems. She was already at this point beginning to do what she did for the rest of her life and go around the markets of Paris first thing in the morning to pick up surplus or rejected food, collecting it to feed anyone who happened to turn up at the Rue Lormel during the day. And then she had the extraordinary idea of becoming a nun. She was arguably one of the most un-nun-like people you would <laughs> come across. She was somebody who had had quite a, a colourful young adulthood, let's say. She was a divorcee and a single mother. She was a compulsively sociable person, never happier than arguing through the night with lots of friends and lots of alcohol. And she went to the local Russian bishop in Paris and said, I think I have a vocation to be a nun. And amazingly, the local Russian bishop said, good. <laughs> and with some encouragement from um, Elizaveta's confessor, the great theologian, Father Sergei Bulgakov, Metropolitan Yevlogi, the Russian bishop in Paris, accepted Elizaveta's vows as a nun, and she became Mother Maria, and carried on pretty much as before. <laughs> it was a step which is perhaps rather more important than one might imagine, because although the Russian church had plenty of nuns, there weren't very many nuns who were devoted, as she was, quite simply to the care of the poor. Orthodox nuns tended to be strictly enclosed and contemplative. Mother Maria believed deeply in the prior importance of the contemplative life, but believed even more deeply that if you concentrated on your inner life, your inner life would shrink to become smaller and smaller and smaller. The only way of enriching your inner life was to give and to keep your doors open. And I'll read you a couple of passages about that in a moment. But I just want to give you something of the sense of how her life evolved. A couple of other nuns lived with her for a while and found the pace a bit exhausting and went to slightly more conventional convents. Um, a couple of extremely brave priests ministered to the little community and helped with the practicalities. And Mother Maria went, went on, trudging the streets of Paris first thing in the morning, collecting reject vegetables from the market and going back and making soup. Now, as the 30s wore on, her ministry to refugees began to take on a rather different character. In the 20s, Russian émigrés in Paris formed a constant stream of newcomers and a quite cohesive body of people within Parisian society. But as the 30s unrolled, a new element came in. That's why the first word in my title is race before refugees, because, of course, Jewish refugees from Germany and elsewhere from Eastern Europe began to arrive in Paris as well. And Mother Maria adapted immediately to this new challenge. A refugee was a refugee. She asked no questions about where people came from, what their background was, what their religion was, what their politics were. And so as the 30s moved on, she became more and more the focus of a very, very diverse group of exiles and refugees in Paris and a half amusing and half heartbreaking story is about how one of the local clergy, Orthodox clergy, rebuked her for not serving proper fasting food, according to Orthodox rules, during the fasting seasons in the soup kitchen. Mother Maria took the line that when people were hungry, they were hungry, 
and that the fasting rules of the Orthodox Church were just possibly designed for people other than the homeless and starving, <laughs> and that therefore she was not going to lose any sleep about breaking the fasting rules. And then, of course, the Germans arrived. For a couple of years, Mother Maria and her associates managed to continue something of their ministry, and indeed to develop it in a quite new way. And the new way was attempting to protect people from Jewish communities, from the Nazis, by listing them as members of the Russian Orthodox congregation in the Rue Lormel. Mother Maria had absolutely no qualms about lying to the Nazis. Indeed, made something of a speciality of it. <laughs> and so a good many Jewish individuals and families were able to leave Paris in the early days of the German occupation because they could brandish certificates of Russian Orthodox membership in the face of German authorities and then could leave for the south of France and elsewhere and go to safety. However, this couldn't last too long. The Germans began to clamp down on whatever residual flexibility there was and it was Himmler himself who said that he was no longer going to operate any kind of uh, concessionary system for Jews who had allegedly converted to Christianity. A Jew was a Jew was a Jew. Therefore, everybody of Jewish birth or family was liable to be rounded up and, of course, transported as they were. The dreadful stories about the, the way in which Parisian and other French Jews were held in the sports stadium outside Paris, the winter sports stadium, the Vélo d'Hiver, and then deported to the camps. This was the point at which the attention of the Nazis inevitably came round to the work that was going on in the Rue Lormel. And Mother Maria, her chaplain, Father Dimitri, and her family, her children who still lived with her, were all of them subjected to interrogation. One of the best known stories about that process is when Father Dimitri, the chaplain, had been taken in for questioning and the um, SS officer who was doing the interrogation said, um, I want to know if you know any Jews. And Father Dimitri took the pectoral cross on his chest and held it up and said, this one. <laughs> Mother Maria likewise said at one point, if they come looking for Jews in my house, I'll take them to the chapel and show them the icon of the Mother of God. <laughs> this was also the period when Jews were obliged by law to wear a yellow star to identify them. Mother Maria wrote a very forceful piece, widely circulated in France at the time, saying, this is the time when every Christian ought to volunteer to wear the yellow star. And she had very strong things indeed to say about the need for absolute unquestioning solidarity with the Jewish people at this moment. Again, not something you could take for granted. The Russian Orthodox Church from which she came had and has a very uncomfortable history of anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic rhetoric. Mother Maria cuts through this without any hesitation, without any qualification. So eventually, she and one of her children and one of her associates and Father Dimitri went to the camps. Father Dimitri, her friend Ilya Fundominsky, her son Ilya, all of them died in the camps. And Mother Maria was eventually sent to Ravensbrück concentration camp, where in 1945, she was executed. We have a number of eyewitness testimonies to how she lived and died in the camp, and a confused but persistent story that she offered herself for execution prematurely because of the fear and panic of another woman in the group being selected, that she actually stepped forward to replace somebody else in the queue for the 
execution chamber. We don't know the detail, but it would be entirely in character. About a decade ago, Mother Maria was declared a saint by the Russian Orthodox Church in Western Europe and remains for many Orthodox Christians who are not completely seduced by Putinism and its varieties, a kind of orientation point for an Orthodox Christianity open to the world, free from historic prejudice and committed to radical discipleship. That's a sketch of her remarkable life. But what were the principles and the visions out of which all this came? So time to share a few bits of documentation with you. First of all, just um, one bit of personal reminiscence of her from Konstantin Machulski, another Russian living in Paris. The room in which Mother Maria lives is under the stairs between the kitchen and the hall. In it, there is a large table covered with books, manuscripts, letters, bills, and a quantity of completely incongruous objects. There is a basket of different colored balls of wool and a bowl with some cold tea left unfinished. Bookshelves, cupboards, an old armchair with a stuffing hanging out. The room is unheated, the door is open. There are times when Mother Maria can no longer bear it. She locks the door, drops into the armchair and says, I can't go on like this. I can't take anything in any longer. I'm tired. I'm really tired. There have been about 40 people here today, each with their own sorrow and needs, and I can't chase them away. But locking the door is no solution. Persistent knocking begins. Mother Maria opens the door and says to me, there you go. That's how I live. One of the most striking things about her vision is the centrality within it of community, a theology of community. She bases this on some of the great 19th century Russian theologians who wrote about the idea of sabornost, togetherness, conciliarity, catholicity, call it what you like. In the mid 19th century, this had been a leading notion for some of the Russian philosophers who had helped in the revival of Russian Christianity and used the idea to argue against what they saw as both individualist and authoritarian strands in Western Christianity. The Russians, never backward in coming forward, said the problem with Protestants is that they're all individualists, the problem with Catholics is they're all authoritarians. We Russians know better than anybody, and we believe in subornost. We believe in absolute mutuality and interdependence as the essence of the Christian church. And actually reading some of what they write about subornost, about togetherness in the mid-19th century, you might as well be reading Archbishop Desmond Tutu on Ubuntu in our own age. I am because you are. That's precisely the vision that these theologians develop. But there's rather more to it than just a theology of community because what she underlines is the need for the church when it's engaging with the poor and the needy to be something other than just a kind of ecclesial lady bountiful passing on good things from on high. This is what she wrote in 1939, when she was involved in the setting up of the group called Orthodox Action, which was a, a Russian-based social action program in Paris. We should make every effort to ensure that each of our initiatives is the common work of all those who stand in need of it, not some charitable organization where some people perform charitable works and are accountable for it to their superiors, while others receive the charity, make way for those who are next in line, and disappear from view. We must cultivate a communal, subordinate organism rather than set up a mechanical organization. 
At the same time, we are committed to the personal principle in the sense that absolutely no one can become for us a routine cipher whose role is to swell statistical tables. I would say that we should not give away a single piece of bread unless the recipient means something as a person for us. Now, what strikes me about that is both the intense focus on reciprocity and face-to-face -face relation and that deeply challenging principle that you can't just be a charitable organization as a Christian body. And I, I'm very taken with that line. Others receive the charity, make way for those who are next in line and disappear from view. Christian diaconia, Christian service, can't have that production line character about it. There must be something relational that lasts from this contact. And I have to say that's one of the things that strikes me about the vision of Christian aid, one of the things that has kept me enthusiastic about Christian aid for such a long time, that we do struggle to do our work as Christian aid on the basis of exactly that vision of a sustained relationship, not just going in, doing something nice and running away again, not just the people standing in line and disappearing from view. Characteristically, Mother Maria goes on to say, by no means does this require us to ensure that each and every drunken scoundrel be sentimentally approved by all. The balance is achieved by care, sobriety, and love. In other words, this is not an uncritical or soft-hearted approach. In some ways, it's a very demanding kind of love indeed, because it seeks to treat the other as an adult, to free them where necessary to be more of an adult, and to be oneself willing to be dependent on the gifts that they give. All of that in the back streets of Paris in the 1920s and 30s. All of that developed, written down in these late nights in an unheated room with the Nazis knocking on the door. You can see, I hope, why she's such an extraordinary, exhilarating figure to get to know Mother Maria. The Orthodox Church is a church which, for all sorts of good reasons, values tradition and continuity and beauty. But Mother Maria had learned to be a little bit wary of tradition and continuity and beauty. She'd known in her own life profound personal tragedy, the death of a child in agonizing circumstances. She'd known disruption and exile. She'd felt that her own discipleship had been, as it were, refined in the crucible of the 20th century city and the 20th century revolutionary crucible of violence and disorder. And she was very wary indeed of any kind of rhetoric about the church which pretended that the church could be some kind of safe space, untouched by the realities of the century. And here she is on this subject. The eyes of love will perhaps be able to see how Christ himself departs quietly and invisibly from the sanctuary that is protected by a splendid screen. The singing will continue to resound. Clouds of incense will still rise. The faithful will be overcome by the ecstatic beauty of the services, but Christ will go out onto the church steps and mingle with the crowd, the poor, the lepers, the desperate, the embittered, the holy fools. Christ will go out into the streets, the prisons, the hospitals, the low haunts and dives. Again and again, Christ lays down his soul for his friends. What are our beauty and our ugliness in comparison with Christ, his eternal truth and eternal beauty? Does our beauty not look ugly when compared to his eternal beauty? Or is it not the reverse? Does he not see in our ugliness, in our impoverished lives, in our festering sores, in our crippled souls, does he not see there his own divine image 
and a reflection of his eternal glory and eternal beauty. And so he will return to the churches and bring with him all those whom he has summoned to the wedding feast has gathered from the highways, the poor and maimed, the prostitutes and sinners. And the most terrible thing is that it may well be that the guardians of beauty, those who study and understand the world's beauty, will not comprehend Christ's beauty and will not let him into the church because behind him there will follow a crowd of people deformed by sin, ugliness, drunkenness, depravity and hate. Then their chant will fade away in the air, the smell of incense will disperse, and someone will say to them, I was hungry and you gave me no food. That's an enormously moving passage, I think, and it calls to mind one of the great insights of St. Teresa of Avila when she's writing about the Lord's Prayer. And she says, when we say, Our Father, we, all of us who pray it, with our doubts and our sins and our complications and our general messiness, we are associating ourselves with Christ. We are claiming a right to enter the domestic space of God himself. And surely, says St. Teresa, God the Father must be horrified by the people that Jesus Christ is bringing home with him. <laughs> only, she goes on, the catch is, we're told in the Gospels, that Jesus only ever does what the Father wants. So presumably, the Father actually wants all these disreputable people to come home with the Son. I think that's exactly what Mother Maria is saying in rather more poignant and direct terms, in fact, because she's talking there about how the church itself may be blinded to the beauty of divine love by the apparent ugliness of the objects of divine love. God loves what's not lovely. And love to the loveless shown that they might lovely be, of course, is a phrase we've been singing not so very long ago, probably, in Passion Tide at Easter. She also writes about what she calls non-possession. She's taken monastic vows, and so, of course, she takes it for granted that poverty is part of what she's now committed to. But she wants to let us know that there's a difference between poverty, as we often understand it, and the spiritual attitude of non-possession. Our whole approach to life must be the opposite of possessiveness. And if so, we are freed from both greed and miserliness, she says. We're freed from clinging to what we have. We're freed from grasping for what we can get. It doesn't mean that we don't attend to ourselves and are conscious of our own needs, but we no longer have an attitude of possessiveness to ourselves or to others. And she's got some very interesting things to say about possessiveness in terms of our inner life, not just our literal possessions. The virtue of non-possession should make a person open to the world and to people. Life outside the church, and in part a distorted understanding of Christianity, accustom us to hoarding our inner riches and to being eternally curious, greedy with regard to our neighbor's spiritual world. We can be possessive in terms of our intrusiveness towards other people, our desire to understand them, to get them into our framework, push them into our categories. And her whole ministry, it seems to me, is very deeply shot through with this non-possessiveness. She begins, remember, as someone who is ministering to people like herself, Russian refugees, and imperceptibly, it morphs into caring for strangers, people of another race and religion, and regarding them with the same deep respect and love. And she says that if you attempt to hold on to your inner life at the expense of this openness, we know what this idea leads to. We know the egoism that can reign in the world, 
We know how peoples care for their spiritual peace. Their locking themselves away leads before our eyes to self-poisoning, demoralization, loss of joy. These people become unbearable to themselves. In a pa most paradoxical way, they become poor from holding on to themselves. They become poor from holding on to themselves. It's a phrase to take to bed with you, isn't it? Keep you awake, probably, <laughs> as it does me. They become pure, poor from holding on to themselves. And the effect of a certain kind of care for one's spiritual life is a loss of joy. As I said before, she's not somebody who wants to overthrow the discipline and practice, the richness of the liturgical life that she has as a Russian Orthodox Christian. Far from it. She practiced that faithfully. She wrote about it eloquently. But she wanted to see it within the entire ecology of discipleship as something which had always to be realized in that non-possessiveness with which you approached the souls and the bodies of others. And one last quote from her. When we approach the other person, the stranger, the demanding knock on the door, the new influx of refugees, what we must respond with is almost a kind of holy terror. In turning to the other, to the one we're called to serve, we cannot replace everything in the spiritual area by choosing only the highest spiritual qualities. Here begins what is most difficult and demands the maximum ascetical effort and attention. In turning our spiritual world towards the spiritual world of another, we encounter the terrible inspiring mystery of the authentic knowledge of God. Because what we encounter is not flesh and blood, not feelings and moods, but the authentic image of God in humanity, the incarnate icon of God in the world, a glimmer of the mystery of the incarnation and the union of divinity and humanity. And we must unconditionally, unreservedly, accept this terrible revelation of God must bow down before the image of God in the brother or sister. Only when we feel it, see it, and understand it will yet another mystery be revealed to us, which demands of us our most strenuous struggle. We will see how this image is obscured and distorted by the power of evil. We will see the human heart where the devil wages a ceaseless struggle with God. In the name of the image of God, in the name of love for this image that pierces our heart, we will want to begin a struggle with the devil and become an instrument of God in this terrible, scorching work. And we will be able to do it if all our hope is in God, not ourselves. If we have not a single subtle or mercenary desire. If we lay down our armor like David. A terrible revelation. A terrible revelation. The sense of the intensity of God's presence in the person whose need knocks on our door because we believe in the image of God in humanity. Another deeply rooted theme in Eastern Christianity especially, but one which for Mother Maria was anything but a bit of abstract theology. I began by talking about Mother Maria's life and have only now begun to read a bit of her theologizing about it because I think you may see what I mean by describing her story as a theological narrative. Her life puts the question to us, what kind of vision of God and humanity generates that kind of sacrifice, that kind of generosity? For herself, the theology constantly was distilled out of the life that she led. And to think of the life that she led, I'm suggesting, is not just to think about somebody who was a spectacularly generous philanthropist. She was more than that because of her deep belief that what she was doing was not handing out charity, but participating in community. Not handing out charity, but participating in community. 
I mentioned at the beginning of these remarks the impression made on me by the work of Flanvar Penris. And I suppose one reason I would say I've seen the church and it works in that context is that that always appeared to me as a community, not a charity. As a place where there was a genuine union of vision, a genuine interdependence, a sense of solidarity, not a sense of good being done from on high. And it's probably one of the toughest things for us, especially some of us in um, larger, wealthier, older, and slower churches, naming no names. <laughs> Quite a challenge to, th to rethink the essence of church identity in terms like that. But Disciples in the Modern City, I took that as a title not to focus our attention on urban rather than rural ministry or whatever, but just to note that the whole city, the whole civic civilization we're part of these days is where we now operate as disciples, as congregations, as communities. And that's where the challenge comes. What kind of solidarity, what kind of mutuality do we create with those who are on the margins of what we regard as the safe institution? We've seen it. We've all seen it. We can all celebrate it. We can all, and I do mean we and all, because it's a question to myself, we can all go away and reflect prayerfully and gratefully and uncomfortably on how we move from a church which is just that little bit afraid, even if we're not Russian Orthodox, just that little bit afraid of people coming in to disturb the beauty we can cope with so that we begin to recognize the beauty that is Christ in his divine generosity and recognizing that that's actually the transforming thing. I'm sure that Mother Maria believed that the Jewish refugees who came to her and Father Dmitri asking for those forged certificates of Russian Orthodox membership, that they were actually part of her community, that the relationship she had with them was one of subordinate, that she wasn't just doing them a favor, but that somehow she was entering into their condition. And of course, her end shows that. She died alongside precisely those people. And that's why race and refugee issues end up for her with martyrdom. Probably not many of us will end up in that particular place. Let's pray we don't, because we do, after all, pray every day not to be brought to the time of trial. One of the most realistic prayers that our Lord encourages us to pray, I think. That being said, why did Mother Maria end her life as a martyr? because she believed in that kind of church and lived it. Thank you. We have plenty of time for comments or questions, so who would like to begin? We have microphones as well that we can take around to whoever wants to make a contribution so we can all hear clearly. Would anybody like to start?